Good morning, People's Church. How many have felt the presence of Jesus in this place? We should give Jesus a shout of praise right now. Amen? Come on, act like you love Jesus. It's been fantastic here today. Uh, thank you, Pastor Brad, for those kind words of, of introduction. We are brother-in-laws, but the in-law fell off years ago, and so this is my uh, this is my brother, and so thanks for those kind words. I just sensed the presence of Jesus in this place, so uh, right after service, I've already talked to my assistant, and we're getting plane tickets for the whole worship team to come to Oklahoma and live there to help with my church. Pastor Deshaun would never forgive me, but how about the worship team? Give it up for them. My goodness. You are blessed beyond measure. Just was so thrust into the very presence of God today. And then I've heard about your pastor for, for so long. In fact, uh, I have, I've been blessed with some mentors. I, I'm the only pastor in my family. I didn't know what I was getting into when, when the Lord tapped my shoulder. But God blessed me with great mentors, and many of my mentors have been influenced uh, by your pastor, uh, Pastor Sapp and the Kusaharos and the Yasoharas and even the Brugmans uh, have been touched by his life, and I'm so honored that you would uh, allow me to share your pulpit today, brother. Can you give it up for the greatest pastor on the planet, Pastor Deshaun and his precious family? And to preach with my friends here, uh, Mark and Aaron and, and Brad and Jason, it's a, it's a great honor. These are some of the greatest preachers in the United States. If you ask them, they'll tell you. Just come up and ask them. But just amazing ministers of the gospel. Uh, so it's an honor to come to the Word today. We're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12, if you have your Bibles, if you want to turn there. As I've been here the last several days, my ears have been listening to some of your leaders and, and your pastor's heart and, and people in the church. And I believe God has put people's church in a strategic place at a strategic time for such a time as this. How many believe it's time to reach this city for Jesus? God has blessed you with so many decades of fruitful ministry and strategy and prayer intercession. I believe today is the day that all that culminates. How many know God is up to something? I believe God wants you to reach this nation, the beautiful nation of Sri Lanka, for Jesus. If that meshes in your spirit, put your hands together. If you believe now is the time for a great move of God, put your hands together right now. How many know those aren't your dreams? Those wouldn't be something that you would just come up with. How many know God wants you to reach your city more than you want to reach your city? God wants you to reach your nation more than you want to reach the nation. But we have an enemy, and he would like for us to give up. He throws all kinds of traps and tests and trials in our way. He tries to get us discouraged. He tries to get us to throw in the towel. He tries to get us to quit. He's come against me so many times. He's just so persistent. But I've traveled 15,000 kilometers to tell you, don't give up. Each and every one of you has a God-ordained plan right in front of you. This church is filled with so many beautiful people. Your great leadership team with your pastor. But every life in this church is important to God. And before the foundations of the world, before God designed this beautiful creation, he designed your life with a plan. You are not here by accident. You are here on purpose. And God needs you to finish your race. Not to give up, not to be discouraged, but to go towards what Jesus has planned for you. How many believe that today? Now, I did some reading, and, and the Bible here in Hebrews chapter 12 will go to it says that we're supposed to run towards Jesus and what he's planned for us. And Sri Lanka has produced some great runners in your history. Yesterday we had some time, so we went to a rugby match. Any rugby players in the house? You are tough. That is one amazing game. And I was amazed that the rugby runners ran up and down that course. I wondered how your pastor runs and does all the ministry. He was a rugby player, so ministry's easy after running on the field like that for so many years. 
running up and down. Years ago, there was a Sri Lanka runner. His name was Karu Anandu, and he ran many races in your country. He ran internationally. He ran so many races. He collected so many medals. And in the 1960s, he actually completed every runner's dream. He qualified for the Olympics, and he did fairly well. But when it came to his specialty, which was the 10,000 meters, the night before, he became ill. His stomach was not well. His body had a fever, and he began to ache. How many know when you're running the race, sometimes you don't have a very good day? This was the day he had been waiting for for so long, and yet he was sick and up all night. The next morning, people said, you shouldn't even go to the race. You are so ill. But he went to the race because he had trained for so long. He went to the race, and he began to run. And because his body was so fatigued and so sick and so ill, he could not keep his normal pace. But he heard the starting gun, and he began to run. And he began to run. And he began to run. And when the winner of that race, it wasn't him, but when the winner of the race ran through the, ran through the tape, he was right there. Not because he was competing for first place, because the first place runner had lapped him four times. But he kept running. In fact, the, last, the first lap after the first place winner ran through the tape, the crowd began to kind of jeer because they were just ready for this to be over. Other men just quit. People that didn't win the race, they just quit. Not him. He continued to run that last lap, the second last lap, the third last lap. By the fourth last lap, his final lap, the crowd began to cheer so much. They could tell he didn't feel good. They could tell he was ill, but he was going to finish his race. By the end of the race, the crowd, the arena, began to stand on their feet, and he received a larger ovation than the first place winner of that race. God didn't call you to run fast. God didn't call you to be first place, but God called you to run the race that is set before you. If you believe that, would you stand for the reading of the word this morning? Would you stand with me? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I want us to memorize one small passage here in this, in this scripture. I believe the verses will be on the screen. And can we just say this together? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Hebrew author writes this, Wherefore? Seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, it's you, endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Can we go back to verse 1, media team? Thanks so much for helping me today. I have my congregation, I challenge them every week to memorize a portion of scripture because it's so important to take the word of God and put it in your hearts. For many years, people memorized the word of God and now we have it on our phones and our tablets and on our shelves, but we don't put it in our heart. So I just want to give you the word of God because when the enemy came to Jesus, Jesus defeated the devil by quoting the word of God. And when the enemy comes to you to throw in the towel this week, I want you just to quote this piece of scripture. Just repeat this after me. Let us, oh, I can't hear you. Let us run with patience the race that is set before you. Let's do it again. Let us run with patience the race that is set before you. One more time and you got it. Let us run with patience the race that is set before you. Hebrews 12.1. Let's pray. Jesus, would you help us for the next few moments? Hear your spirit whisper. I believe someone, maybe many in this room, have been discouraged this week. The enemy has brought a circumstance. Perhaps someone has said something or done something that was so painful, and even to get to church today was a painful choice for them. But today, your Holy Spirit knows right where they're at. And I pray that we would run the race that you have called us to with patience towards you, towards your arms. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I knew this message was for you. You may be seated. Now, can you quote sitting down? Say this verse with me. Let us run with patience the race that is set before you. The race that is set before you will not look like anybody else's race. God designed yours specifically for you, so don't compare and contrast. 
Now, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. I encourage you in your own discipleship time to study this book. It bridges the gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Luther said the hardest part of understanding the Bible was understanding the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the writer of Hebrews does that with such excellence. We don't know who it was. Some think Paul, some think Apollos. We just don't know. So the writer of Hebrews is talking to Jewish believers And in the Jewish faith at this time, it's become very difficult to follow Jesus. For some of you this week, it was difficult to follow Jesus. Some of you faced persecution, perhaps at school, perhaps at work, perhaps in your community. And that's what the the audience of this book was going through. It was very difficult. They could be stoned by their Jewish brothers. They could be burned at the stake by their Roman counterparts. And some of them were trying to go back to their old ways, the Jewish faith. And the writer of Hebrews says, no, no, no. What Jesus has brought to you is better than anything that you've had in the past. Don't throw away what God has done through Jesus Christ for the old ways. Run towards Jesus. If you remember in the Old Testament when God set the Israelites free from Egyptian slavery, God's will is for no one to be in slavery. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But after some time... After some tests, the Israelites said, Moses, you should have never brought us out of Egypt. It was kind of easy back there. And if we're not careful, the enemy will test us. And we'll say, you know, before we dedicated ourselves 100% for God, it was easier back in the earlier life. The writer of Hebrews makes a brilliant legal case to keep running for Jesus. In fact, in chapter 1, he says, in the Old Testament, A few prophets sporadically and intermittently spoke. But now Jesus Christ, the Son of God, speaks to you directly. Has anyone ever heard the voice of Jesus Christ? Shout hallelujah. Is that all that's been spoken to by Jesus? If you've ever heard the whisper of Jesus, shout hallelujah. In Hebrews chapter 2, he says the, the angels actually delivered the law, the Pentateuch, to Moses up on Mount Sinai. But you, Jesus Christ, has delivered the gospel to you in person, and he's confirmed it with signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Has anyone ever experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in this house? Shout praise the Lord. Well, in chapter 3, then the writer of Hebrews says, you all love Moses, and Moses was a good servant of God in God's house. But let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus is the one who built the house. How many know Jesus is building your life? Shout hallelujah. In chapter 4 of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, you knew about Sabbath in your old ways and rest, Shabbat, Shalom. But in the new presence of Jesus, God gives us peace that passes understanding. Has anyone experienced peace that didn't even make sense to have through Jesus? Shout praise the Lord. In chapter 5, he said, you had the old priesthood and the old covenant, but now Jesus is our high priest. And he sat down because he's done everything he can to get you reconciled with God the Father. Praise the Lord if you're reconciled with God the Father. Man, you should be more excited about it than that. Shout hallelujah. In chapter 6, he says, the old covenant was a sure foundation, but now Jesus is an anchor of the soul so that when we don't even understand the chaos of life, Jesus comes in and he is the anchor that keeps us grounded and going towards his righteousness and sanctification. In chapter 7, he says, you had the Aaronic, the priesthood of Aaron, but now Jesus' priesthood is much better. It's after the order of Melchizedek. You're never going to need an the priests because you got Jesus. You have a great pastoral team, but in the middle of the night, how many have ever gone to Jesus and Jesus showed up right where you were? Never throw in the towel for something else because Jesus is the best way. In chapter 8, the writer of Hebrews says, the old covenant, it taught about righteousness, but the new covenant says, your sins and your iniquities, I will remember no more, Jesus says. How many have met Jesus and he took your sins and he remembers them no more? Somebody ought to shout praise God. Your sins are gone, cast in the sea of forgetfulness. In chapter 9, in the Old Testament, there was the blood of bulls and of goats. 
But in the New Testament, we have the blood of Jesus that makes us white as snow and allows us to come to his table of grace. If you've experienced the blood of Jesus on your heart, shout hallelujah. We get to chapter 10 and we see this incredible argument that he's made comes to this point. And in chapter 10, we see that all the old was just a shadow of the righteousness of God. And he says, having therefore, brethren, boldness, you don't go to the outer courts. You don't go into the holy place. You go into the very holy of holies, where in the Old Testament, only one person went once a year. But, to, but now, by the blood of Jesus, we can go into the holy place right now. If you've been to the holy place, today in worship, would you give the Lord a shout of praise? Now we go all through those chapters and we see in chapter 11 that he makes the argument not to give up because so many in the faith have gone before us. And he paints this picture of an arena that's cheering us on in our race. And he lists these forefathers of ours. He starts with Abel and talks about the faith of God and Enoch, how that he was translated right to heaven. He talks about Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob. He talks about Joseph and Moses. He talks about Rahab and Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah are all listed in what we call the Hall of Faith. These are men and women who ran great, great races, but they're gone now. And they've passed the baton to you. And I'm looking at some Abrahams. And I'm looking at some Sarahs. I'm looking at a Moses in the house. I'm looking at a David. Some of you say, no, not me. I could never be compared to those men of God in Hebrews chapter 11. Would you believe all of them were imperfect? As many lessons as we've heard about them, they all had problems. Noah had a drinking problem. Had a problem keeping his clothes on too. Abraham had a, had a lying problem, but he should have been telling the truth. Sarah had a trust problem. I'm not having no baby at age 90. How many of you would have a trust problem too, right? Jacob was known as a deceiver. Moses was a murderer. Rahab was a prostitute. David, well, we know he had plenty of problems. And if you've had problems today, that does not discount you for running the race of God because when you run right into the gracious hands of Jesus, he sets us free, he cleanses us, and he redeems us. How many of you believe God has set you apart and he has a race for you to run? Are you sensing it by the power of the Holy Spirit today? I want to give you four quick keys of, from the writer of Hebrews on how to run your race. If you're taking notes, here's four quick keys I want to give you. And in just a moment, we're going to run to Jesus. The first one is this. We have to run lightly. Everybody say lightly. Everybody say lightly. I see Christians back where I'm from trying to run the race with all kinds of baggage on their shoulders. They have sins. They have addictions. They have offenses. And the writer of Hebrews says, after he goes through this incredible testimony of witnesses. He says, since we have this great cloud that's cheering us on in the stadium yesterday at rugby, boy, the cheers were amazing. Since we have this great cloud, if we could see in the portals of heaven of them cheering us on, we should lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily trips us up. The Greek actually says the sin that actually keeps clinging to us that we have to separate ourselves from. I ask you today, what Weight is holding you back from running towards Jesus with all your might. What sin has snuck in and keeps you from the place of God that he has set you apart for? If there's some kind of sin in your life today, I want you to know there is no sin that Jesus hasn't conquered. The writer of Hebrews makes that very clear. And today, if you come to Jesus and say, in fact, we had it on the screen. Pastor shared that with us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't leave here today with sin in your heart. Give it to the Lord. Some of you are free from sin, but you've taken up offense. Someone said something or did something, and it hurt. How many know Christians can be stupid sometimes? 
I've got a lot of cray-cray Christians back in my, my place that we try to get closer to Jesus. But they say something and they do something. And later on in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, that little thing can be a root of bitterness that grows up like a vine and suffocates the life out of our spirit if you'll let it. We've got to run lightly. Life is too short to hang on to your offenses. Life is too short to hang on to your burdens, to not forgive someone. To have a spirit of unforgiveness, life is too short. So if you want to run the race of God, you've got to give up everything else, any sin, any distraction, any weight, and we're going to run lightly. Everybody say, I'm going to run lightly. Now, you remember our verse? Have you already forgotten it? Can we say it again? Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So number one, we run lightly. Number two, we run together. Everybody shout out together. The writer of Hebrews didn't say let you run. He didn't say let me run. He said let us run. We need each other. Church is family. When I preached in Japan, they taught me a word ohana, that we are ohana, the family of God, that we need each other. Today, you might have wrestled. I don't know. I got crazy Americans coming to preach. I didn't know if I needed to come to church. Maybe you were right, but the church needed you to come here because everybody needs an encourager. Pastoring now for 25 years, I found this scientifically proven method to determine someone who needs encouragement. How many would like to know this? If you want to know if someone needs encouragement, how many would like this litmus test? Here it is. Are you ready for it? You want to write this down. You know someone needs encouragement if they're still breathing. Anybody need encouragement in the house today? We all do. I've never met anyone in my church to come up and say, Pastor D, I'm so encouraged. Would you please stop? I've never met that person yet. I'm so full of joy. Would you tell these people to please stop encouraging me? No, because the evil one is so full of discouragement that we need each other in our lives. Man, you, need, you have a great pastor. You need to be praying for your pastor and his pastoral team every day because the enemy would like to discourage them, but nothing encourages a pastor like a praying church full of kind words for his family and for his team. You need to find people in the congregation that look discouraged and say, we're going to run this race together. Somebody that stumbled, they tripped up, and yet you are going to be there by their side to help them get through the race. Now, if you look through Hebrews chapter 11, there's a few people that needed a brother or a sister. How many know back in the beginning, Adam needed a brother? He needed a brother to say, don't listen to that woman right now. How many know Eve needed a sister who would come up and be bold enough to say, don't listen to the snake no more? How many knew David had a brother that died, and if Jonathan had still been around, he probably would have remained pure before God? You need a brother. You need a sister. That's why you need to be in small groups. That's why you need to be in discipleship, because we need each other. We need to run together. Everybody say together. So we run lightly, the writer of Hebrews says. We run together, and then we run patiently. Everybody say patiently. Say, oh, no. Remember our verse, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The Bible says we're supposed to run it with patience. Are you running it with patience? Are you ready to give up because God's plan is taking so much time in your life? Think of Noah in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, by faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Let me give you the Wooten version of that. That means that God said, hey, Noah, build a boat. Well, no, well, God, it hasn't even rained yet. That's all right. You build me a boat. And the first 10 years, he started building a boat, and people made fun of Noah. And the next 20 years, they made fun and ridiculed him. The first 60 years, that was okay. First 70 years, oh, I can get through that. It was a hundred years that Noah took to build this boat. Can you imagine the patience, but God used it to save creation? What is God doing behind the scenes in your life? You think it's taking so long, but God on the inside is working things out in you. Think about Moses. 
After he ran from Egypt, he was taken to the backside of the desert to be a shepherd. The second most stupid creation of God are sheep. And Moses is stuck on the backside of the desert taking care of the second most stupid creation because God's getting ready for him to take care of the stupidest creation, humans. And God had to allow Moses to understand sheep on the backside of the desert for 40 years before he could ever become the greatest pastor that ever lived in the Old Testament times. What is God doing in your heart? Been ready to throw in the towel? And yet God says, would you be patient? Those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How many need that kind of strength? Let's say our verse. And let us run. I can't hear you. And let us run with patience. The race that is set before you. Are you ready to run? Number one, we run lightly. Number two, we run together. Number three, we run with patience. And number four, we run towards Jesus. Let me close with this verse. Verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here's what happened with Jesus. He came with a race set before him. It was to redeem all of us, to redeem all of mankind. And this was a, a very heavy mission. You remember him in the garden, As he was praying, he looked down into that spiritual cup, and when he looked down, he saw all the sins of you, all the sins of me, all the sins of humanity. And he said, Father, if there be any other way, take this cup from me. But there was no other way. Jesus was the perfect lamb of redemption. You know what Jesus saw when he was being beat, when he was being spit upon, when a crown of thorns pierced his skull, when he was being whipped with a cat of nine tails and flesh was being ripped out of his back, when he was hanging in humiliation on the cross and soldiers gambling for his garments. Do you know what got Jesus through according to this verse of Hebrews? He said, for the joy that was set before him. Who is that? That's you. That when Jesus was running his race, his eyes were on you. I can't even understand that, that the Son of God was thinking about me when he was ready to give up. He says, my Father, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God. And yet he kept his eyes on you, and he finished the course, and he died. But he rose again the third day, and if he's in your heart, give him a shout of praise right now. Can you do it? If Jesus is in your heart, give praise to him right now. So how do I keep my eyes on Jesus when I'm ready to throw in the towel? When life gets tough and discouraging, when people do unfair things and say horrible things. I don't care about people saying unfair things about me. I've heard it all already. When people say unfair things about your family or your loved ones or they do silly things and it just grieves your heart and you're ready to throw in the towel, you remember Jesus kept his eyes on you. So I'm going to keep my eyes on on Jesus. Are you willing to run the race? One last time, can we say the verse? When the devil comes to you and says, throw in the towel, give up. You don't need to pray today. You don't need to get in the word. You don't need to go to your small group. You don't need to come to church next week. You're going to quote this verse and we can all say it together by now. Can we say it together? And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Pastor D, you'll say to me, I can't run. Spiritually, I'm just too weak. I can't make it. Musicians are going to come back up if you would help me today. I want to close with a story that happened at the same time as Karunandu running from Sri Lanka at the 1964 Olympics. At that time, a child was born in the United States. He was born with terrible infirmity in his body. Cerebral palsy, physical deformity. His name was Rick. His parents were so grieved because he could, the doctor said he'll never be able to walk, he'll never be able to communicate normally, and their heart was just so full of grief. 
So as he grew, they wanted to give him a normal lifestyle, so they put him in schools. And through a grant, he was not able to speak. Through a grant, they were able, through a computer, to get him to be able to pick out letters with a cursor. And through small words, he was able to communicate with his father. And in their community, there was a race for someone that was very sick. And, and the son, through the computer, said, I want to run the race. And his dad didn't know how he could ever run the race. He couldn't even walk. But he kept saying, I want to run the race, Dad. So his dad assembled a little cart. And his son would never be able to run. And his dad was never a runner. But he placed his paraplegic son in this cart. And they began to run a race. They inspired dozens of people that day. Then they ran another race. They inspired thousands of people. Then they ran a marathon. And they ran, they inspired tens of thousands. Then they ran a triathlon. And the dad would put his son Rick in a boat. And he would pull him behind him as he swam. As he ran, he assembled a, a seat on his bike so he could run the bike. And now for more than 30 years, their last name Hoyt, Team Hoyt, has been running races, inspiring tens of thousands around the globe. Perhaps you feel like Rick Hoyt. You can't run anymore. The enemy has thrown a landmine at you. I want you to know your heavenly father is more gracious than Rick's. And if you'll just run to him today, you'll find that he's already running to you. And that he'll put his arms of grace around you. He'll strengthen you. And he'll place you in his cart. And he'll push you to the finish line where God has greatness for you. Some of you had dreams years ago and you've given up on them because of life's circumstances. And God says today, just run towards me and I'll pick you up and we'll get there. Some of you have been discouraged by things even in the church. But God says, don't worry about that. I was just building fortitude inside of you. Now would you come to my arms and let me pick you up. Some of you are sick today physically. Run to Jesus. He loves you so much. His healing arms are here for you. Some of you need a touch in your marriage today. Would you take your marriage and run to Jesus and you'll discover that he's already running towards you. Some of you need a touch in your mind. The enemy has come to torment you. And if you'll just take a step towards Jesus, I've discovered that he'll already be running towards you and that he'll be gracious towards you. If you want to run the race that Jesus has set before you, it won't look like anybody else's race. If you want to finish the course, if you're tired of saying, I wish I could do that for God, I wish I had done that for God, when you get to heaven, he will not say, well wished, my good and faithful servant. He'll only say, well done. And if you're ready to do something great, to finish the plan that God set before you, would you stand all over this place? God has a place for you. God has encouragement for you today. God wants to breathe his spirit upon you today. Two weeks ago today, I ran my very first marathon. I've never been a runner. In February, God told me, run. I was hoping that was a metaphor for something. And I didn't know what it was, so I began to run. I've run many, many miles this year. And I've heard of hitting the wall. And two weeks ago, I didn't hit the wall. The wall hit me. I injured my foot. I couldn't run any further. But I said, I've trained. I'm going to finish the course with God's help. He helped me run across the finish line. Perhaps the wall of life has hit you today. But in just a moment, I want you to run towards Jesus. I'm going to turn this over to Pastor Deshaun. But right now, if you need a touch from God, whether you're in the balcony or in the back or on the sides, would you run to Jesus? Would you run to his arms? And as soon as you take one step, you're going to discover he's already running towards you. He's embracing you right now all over this place. Would you begin to run towards this altar? Don't worry about what other people will think. Don't worry about what the enemy has spoken to you, but you want to finish the course. Right now, would you step out from where you're at and say, I'm going to run to Jesus. You need touching your body. You need a touch in your marriage. You need a touch in your finances. Right now, all over this place, would you run towards Jesus?